Hello YouTube, my name is Octopus Joey. Dang, I've been inactive. Welcome to my first ever comparison review where I compare two games and tell you which one is better and why. Today I'm going to compare Super Mario 64 to Banjo-Kazooie. First of all, this is only my opinion, so if you disagree, that's fine. And I'd love to hear why. Super Mario 64 is a 3D platformer in which you collect stars. Banjo-Kazooie is a 3D platformer in which you collect notes, jiggies, gingers, honeycomb pieces, momo tokens, eggs, feathers, EVERYTHING! While both are collectathons, the main difference is that in Super Mario 64, each star you collect is split up into different missions. You go into a level, you get a star, you come out. You go back in the level, you get another star, you come back out. In Banjo-Kazooie, however, when you collect a Jiggy, you just continue on to collect more Jiggies. Some people argue that Banjo-Kazooie's style is better because you don't have to redo the level after collecting a Jiggy, whereas in Super Mario 64, you have to start the whole level over again. But I say otherwise. There's a decent bit more variety to how you collect stars in Super Mario 64 than how you collect Jiggies in Banjo-Kazooie. Maybe you could win a race, go down a slide, win a race going down a slide, sit on a magic carpet for five minutes, ugh. Collect eight red coins, ground pound a wooden stake, just whatever, it has more variety. Not to say that Banjo-Kazooie doesn't have variety in that way, but it seems to have a lot more run around and collect this, run around and collect that, than Super Mario 64 does. And even when it is varied, sometimes it's not varied in a good way. Finish a stupid puzzle that a four-year-old wouldn't find fun, bam, jiggy. Memory games without a consistent camera angle, making it so that you have to remember the colors rather than the position? Sounds fun! But those moments are few and far between. Some better examples of variety in collecting jiggies are getting an ape to throw oranges at panels, shooting stuff, racing, battling a giant crab that isn't that exciting actually, exploiting golden feathers, flying into snowmen with a not very well designed attack that I will talk about later, oh yeah, and flying. But most of the Jiggies are collected by walking around and finding them along your way. And honestly, that isn't a bad thing, and it really isn't as tedious as it sounds. In fact, there is some of that in Super Mario 64, but a lot of it is your set objective, whereas in Banjo-Kazooie, you just kinda do it while you're exploring. But still, Super Mario 64 has a lot more variety in that way. Now let's talk about the coins, or in Banjo-Kazooie's case, notes. Coins in Super Mario 64 restore your life somehow, and in every main level you get a star for collecting 100 of them. In Banjo-Kazooie, you have a set note score for each level, which can be anywhere from 0 to 100. If you collect all 100 notes in a level without dying or re-entering, you've maxed out your note score for that level and added 100 notes to your overall score. Your overall note score is used to open up more of the overworld. This system works, but there is one thing I really hate about it. If you die in a level, you lose all the notes for that level. While however many notes you have still count for your overall note score, if you want a higher note score for that level, you have to collect all those notes again. So if you want to get all 100 notes for that level, you have to do it all without dying. Some argue that it adds to the challenge. Controversy time! I don't think being too unforgiving is a good form of challenge. In games in general, not just Banjo-Kazooie, I think challenge should be about testing and improving your skill, not severely punishing you for missing a jump or dying three times. Now, I'm not saying that every game should just immediately start you back from where you died with full health, but I am saying that it shouldn't require you to do the same thing over again if that thing is too monotonous upon immediate replay. Replaying a short level or part of a long level is fine, there just needs to be a good balance between what's too forgiving and what's too unforgiving. In Banjo-Kazooie, dying with more than 70 notes is very frustrating and ruins the experience in the moment. On my first playthrough of the game, usually when I died with a lot of notes, I'd turn off the Nintendo 64 and try again the next day. One might argue that Super Mario 64 does the same thing with 100 coin stars. But in Banjo-Kazooie, there are 100 notes in each world, and to 100% the game, you have to collect all of them. In Super Mario 64, there are only two courses in which there are less than 110 coins, and they're both water levels, and in water, you can swim to the surface to heal. In other words, you're not likely to die collecting them. And, you only need 100 coins in each level to 100% the game. On top of that, minor spoiler, in Banjo-Kazooie, you need a note score of 810 out of 900 to beat the game, and if you want to stand a chance against the final boss, you need 882. 
In Super Mario 64, you only need 70 stars out of 120 to beat the game. As for the controls, one of the most common complaints, if not the most common complaint with Super Mario 64, is the camera. It really is an age thing, considering this was the first 3D game with a fully controllable camera, but still, the camera kinda sucks. It's okay for the most part, but a lot of times it just pans wherever it wants and doesn't let you move it to the angle that you want. There is a trick around this, though. If you press R to go into the first person mode that no one ever uses and then zoom out, you have a lot more control over the camera. It's still far from perfect though, as the camera still automatically pans behind Mario. The camera in Banjo-Kazooie isn't amazing either. A few times I found it stuck and unable to move in the direction that I wanted because there was a wall like 20 feet behind me. But for the most part, the camera in Super Mario 64 is worse. In both games, the characters themselves control just fine. Banjo's speed is a little slow, but that's quickly resolved with a move you unlock in the first level called the Talon Trot. As for underwater controls, Super Mario 64 is a lot better. In Banjo-Kazooie, you basically have two ways of swimming. If you hold A, you move slowly, but you can easily control where you're going. If you hold B, you swim faster, but it's a lot harder to control. If you know what you're doing, you know to switch between these depending on how precise you need to be. But if you're new, it might feel like you're either controlling a drunk ice skater in space, or an upside down turtle on King Kai's planet. In Super Mario 64, you hold A to swim at a fairly normal speed, but pushing A boosts you forward more as it is a stroke or something. I really don't know much about swimming. And because of that, pushing A once every second or so is the fastest way to swim. It works very well. In both games, there are certain power-ups, unlockables, and sometimes even transformations that switch up your controls a little bit. Both games have sections in which you need to fly. I'd say for flying itself, Banjo-Kazooie is not necessarily better, but more satisfying in the sense that you can easily gain altitude mid-air. In Super Mario 64, whatever height you can get from triple jumping or blasting out of a cannon is about as high as you're gonna get. However, the biggest problem with flying in Banjo-Kazooie is definitely the beak bomb attack. It kinda works, but it's horrible for precision, which sucks because in certain parts of the game, you need to be precise to hit certain targets. Even if you visualize Kazooie's beak as being the crosshair, you still won't hit your target most of the time. Super Mario 64's only other power-up that changes your controls is the Koopa Shell, which controls very well. Everything else in Banjo-Kazooie controls well, although most of your alternate forms move kinda slow. As for the music, both games have great soundtracks, but Banjo-Kazooie's soundtrack is far superior. Super Mario 64's music itself is very well made, but dang if it isn't reused a lot. The bob on Battlefield music is used in four main levels, the Cool Cool Mountain music, which is just a remix of bob on Battlefield, is used twice, Jolly Roger Bay's music is used three times if you count the Secret Aquarium, the Bowser level music is used three times, Lethal Lava Land's music is used twice, Hazy Maze Cave's music is used five times if you include certain areas within other levels that use it, and the Castle Secret Slide music, which is another remix of bob on Battlefield, is used if you include secret levels seven times. Banjo-Kazooie has a different song every level, and it's always played slightly differently depending on what part of the level you're in. Some levels like Rusty Bucket Bay and Clanker's Cavern even have two different songs completely. Also, they're really well made and catchy, and they add a lot to the levels. Another advantage that Banjo-Kazooie has over Super Mario 64 is its presentation. First of all, Banjo-Kazooie has better graphics, which is to be expected considering it came out after Super Mario 64. Second, Banjo-Kazooie is more impressive from a cinematic standpoint. Banjo-Kazooie has a really... I don't know... good way of showing text. It shows the face of whoever's saying it and repeats a little voice clip so you know what the character is supposed to sound like. It also helps that the characters actually have some personality. On top of that, the same style of text that's used in cutscenes is used in-game. While that is a minor detail, it helps keep it consistently cinematic without shoving a bunch of cutscenes in your face. Most text in Super Mario 64, even if it's a character saying it, doesn't leave any more of an impression than just reading a sign. Cheap difficulty? In Super Mario 64, I can't really think of any times the difficulty is cheap, except maybe TikTok Clock, where missing one jump can cause you to have to climb all the way back up. Also, the hitbox on the eel in Jolly Roger Bay is a little weird. I already talked about how in Banjo-Kazooie, it's a little too unforgiving at times, especially on your first playthrough. What I didn't mention is that there are a few cases in which the difficulty is really cheap. First example, King Sandy Butt's Maze. 
You could have almost all the notes up to this point, and then, surprise, you come across King Sandy Butt's maze. If you don't get through it in time, you die. And if you have less than 100 notes, you gotta get them again. Hey look, I made it, but I missed the witch switch. Gotta go back and do it again. Another example of cheap difficulty is the engine room in Rusty Bucket Bay. Experienced players know to go to this room first because it's one of the only places in the game where missing a jump will kill you. And I think cheap difficulty is a good way to segue into talking about final bosses. Spoiler alert, skip to this timecode to avoid spoilers. In Banjo-Kazooie, the final boss is really good from a cinematic standpoint. But from a gameplay standpoint, it's cheap, to say the least. First of all, this boss battle is long. And if you die once, you have to start again from the beginning of the boss fight. Again, a bit too unforgiving. Now the first stage, I have no problem with. The second stage, pretty fun. The third stage requires precision and timing with the Beak Bomb attack. And like I said earlier, the Beak Bomb attack is horrible for precision. The last two phases are also pretty bad. First, four Jinjo statues appear. You shoot eggs in them to make a giant Jinjo statue appear. And holy crap, from a cinematic standpoint, it's really exciting. But then the last stage where you have to shoot eggs into all four sides of the Jinjo statue is probably the worst part of the battle. Grunty is constantly shooting you with attacks that seem to predict where you're gonna go, so they're really hard to dodge even if you're moving around. But your egg shooting attack requires you to stand still. Put the two together and you're gonna ah! Super Mario 64's final boss isn't that great either. To start with, it's just like the first two Bowser fights, but instead of throwing Bowser into a bomb once, you do it three times. However, once you've thrown him into the second bomb, Bowser makes the big circular platform you're standing on turn into a smaller star-shaped platform. And after that, you can't get Bowser to chase you to get him close to a bomb, so you have to throw him a decently long distance. And to be honest, throwing Bowser is even worse for precision than the Big Bomb, and it's definitely not good for the controller. It involves joystick spinning, and it's about as easy to time as one of those spinning light games that you see at Chuck E. Cheese. Overall, neither final boss is particularly well designed. I'd say Super Mario 64's final boss is more playable, but Banjo-Kazooie's is more impressive. Take your pick. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is 100% bonuses. Again, spoiler warning, skip to this time code if you care. In Banjo-Kazooie, if you collect more notes and jiggies than required, or 100% the game, you get feather and egg refills every time you start the final boss, and double health. Another thing that isn't really a 100% bonus, but is still extra content nonetheless, Bottles Puzzle. If you stand on the edge of the rug in Banjo's house after finishing Treasure Trove Cove, zoom in and look at the picture of Bottles, he gives you a puzzle to complete. And every time you complete it, you get a code to enter on the Treasure Trove Cove sandcastle floor. But as hilarious as they are, it's very tedious and not worth it. As for Super Mario 64, if you get all 120 stars, a cannon opens up outside the castle which you can then use to get on top of the roof. When you go up there, Yoshi gives you 100 lives, breaks the fourth wall, and then commits suicide. You'll then find that your normal triple jump is replaced with this, and you can fly around the castle using the winging cap. I'm gonna go ahead and say that Banjo-Kazooie's extra content is better, because when I first 100%ed Super Mario 64, I wanted there to be a lot more to do, and I spent a lot of time looking for secrets. In Banjo-Kazooie, there are a lot of secrets. Overall, it's kinda hard to say which one's better. I'd say Banjo-Kazooie is more flawed, but more cinematically and graphically impressive, and more detailed than Super Mario 64. Super Mario 64 has more variety in its gameplay, and it has more content in the sense that there are more levels and more stars. However, in Banjo-Kazooie, there's more secrets and more stuff to do, and there's more substance to each level in Banjo-Kazooie. It's very close, but I'm gonna say that Banjo-Kazooie is just barely better than Super Mario 64. I know I had a lot of negative stuff to say about Banjo-Kazooie, but it's better on a presentation level, almost as good on a gameplay level. Its music is better, there's a lot more substance to it, it's a lot more polished and less glitchy. Both are fantastic games, but Banjo-Kazooie wins by just a little bit. If you disagree with my points, please let me know why.
My name is Octopus Joey. Bye. That wasn't supposed to rhyme.